you very much. And um, after seeing all the presentations today, I do feel under a little bit of pressure. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping we can actually pull together some of the amazing advice that's been shared today. So I wanted to talk about our journey in creating our digital strategy. And it's a bit of two halves, really. It's a bit about what we set out to achieve and talking about creating a digital strategy and then some of the practical bits of transforming that into what we're hoping to achieve as part of our journey. Um, and as the guys have very kindly introduced you to, I'm, I'm Al Kingsley, uh, and there's a contact point there. And I suppose the big summary really was that's what we were trying to achieve, a vision of what is possible in a school for the digital world. Um, and, you know, we're always on a journey and um, you should never stop believing. You might see a few music references as we wander through uh, the next 25 or 30 minutes. Um, so one thing I, I do quite often, and it was lovely to see Menti being used earlier in the day, um, but at other trusts, when there's inset days that I've been involved in and supporting, I often start with asking that kind of question. What does a digital strategy mean to you? And perhaps not surprisingly, there's that kind of mix between the innovative, exciting, that kind of um, positivity around embracing the, a, a course or a journey on building your digital strategy. But alongside that, there's always those keywords, daunting, confusing, and others. Uh, and I think, um, again, referencing and learning and absorbing as much as I could today during some of the amazing presentations. Um, Nicole Ferguson shared the Kobler-Ross change curve model. And our attempts have been really to go from that denial to experiment phase, missing out the frustration and depression. And I'm not sure we managed it perfectly, but we've certainly managed to cut a few corners. And that's the beauty of the sharing that others who've already been on the journey have done for everybody. Um, this is a really important one. Um, and it is kind of key in many aspects when it comes to digital strategy and that bigger picture of using our technology is that sometimes, you know, you have to look back in order to move forwards. And solutions really are effective if you, you know, if you're picking to add things, you really need to know first and foremost, have they been effective? Have you got a grip on the current technology you use and where it has best impact, where you can evidence it? And I always try and argue, and, and this is something that Mark and I shared in our um, digital strategy guide that he very kindly mentioned earlier. You know, schools are, that are ready for a digital world are reflective. Um, they always have a good sense of looking at what's worked well so far, have reviewed what's been sustainable and embedded. And recently, that's another reason to reflect. Lots of different products and tools have been quickly adopted in order to meet the challenges of COVID. But the real measure of success is whether a tool becomes embedded and, and well used across the school. Uh, where are our collective skills? That's part of our looking backwards across our cohort. And of course, every school's set of collective skills across its teaching group will be different. You know, And do we know what is relevant to help and support that? And so really, we always say, start with knowing what worked best and then look to build on that. Um, and as Niall mentioned earlier, without a plan, you're likely to always be firefighting. Get a grip. What have we got? What IT devices do we have across our estate? Where are they? Are they effectively being used? What software do we use versus subscribe to? And how effectively is that being used? What infrastructure do we have in place? Have we got the right Wi-Fi and other capacities that we might need? Um, and as a, a good friend of mine often says, you know, let's not build on sandy land. So ironically, the more we know what we have, and particularly what we're not using particularly effectively, the more we can save upfront on those costs which may well in due course provide us with that extra flexibility to do more with some new technology moving down the line. The most important message we always look at and focus on when it comes to building a digital strategy is really about the Venn diagram you see there. What are we actually trying to achieve? And of course, it starts rightly at the heart with that feedback from teachers and students about <clears throat> what we can do to improve the teaching and learning experience and outcomes within the classroom setting. But around that, we have all sorts of other stakeholders that we want to include at the point we start the discussion, not to refer back to once a decision's been taken. And of course, they're all different stakeholders. <clears throat> Naturally, our senior leadership team want to be at the heart of that, make sure what we're doing aligns with the school development plan, but also sometimes they need to recognize that there are others who might be better equipped to start shaping some of the ideas and innovation. We want to tie in with our SEND children and make sure that some of the tools we're doing will benefit all. We want to make sure that the solutions we're doing aren't creating data protection concerns. And, and you can read lots of the stakeholders there. The one I always draw to is that finance one, which is often schools experience that request 
at the end of the year or the start of the new academic year that you've got X dollars available to you, what kit do you want? And this is really about not buying piecemeal year by year, but having a bigger picture end game of what you're trying to achieve. And then the money will dictate the pace and speed that you continue on that journey. Priorities are absolutely the key over conveniences. Obviously, we want to make sure that the decisions we take are pedagogy focused, aligned with that school development plan, realistic with capacity. And there's a big killer for many about making sure that what we're trying to achieve genuinely is realistic. Are the things we're going to do be sustainable for the long term benefit of all? And of course, it's all about ultimately impact, impact and impact. Of course, there's different ways to measure impact, and it isn't always in an academic sense. Uh, the next thing really is about confidence. Confidence is king. Uh, great CPD is available regularly. That's a key one. Having CPD for curriculum apps that include the IT department so that they too can provide the level of support you want for those curriculum apps. A big one that I always push on is about having flag bearers. We don't want one person in the school that's the the knowledge bearer of all the key IT products and technology being used across the school. So making sure we embed flag bearers for different products or different solutions that staff know to go to for tips and advice, I think is really, really key. And many of us, certainly our trust included, have learned at the point where COVID came around that the focus on tech has clearly outweighed the conversation about CPD and building that teacher confidence. And this is something that um, many people I'm sure will have seen. It's something that I've um, kindly pinched from Mr. Anderson's slide and used quite regularly. Uh, but really, this is the Sylvia Duckworth model of building that confidence from survival mode to mastery, impact, and ultimately inspiring innovation. And I think across every school, what we certainly saw was that we had teachers that were absolutely feeling like they were thrown into survival mode. And there were others that quickly had that mastery and impact with the tools for particularly remote learning and how we could adapt. Uh, and it's about how we bring those bits together. So focusing on that CPD absolutely is key. Not a surprise, is it? Communication is the key, you know, and I think for every organization, communication is at the heart of a successful model. And COVID-19 highlighted in many ways the need for, as I would say, effective communication particularly internally between leadership and staff, building that consensus. Alongside that, of course, we want to look at our strategy in terms of how does it improve our school to student dialogue, our school to parent dialogue, school to community dialogue. And alongside that, we have certain learners, particularly our SEND cohort, where there's huge benefits to well-being if we've got the right tools in place to keep that regular and reassuring communication. So, of course, all of us have been looking at different tools and delivery platforms, whether it's Teams, Zoom, Hangouts or classroom.cloud, um, but the comms package, you know, like the field of dreams, build it and they will come. And I think this is one of the most important strands is about making sure that everybody's on board. And from all the words of wisdom we've heard earlier today, there's a common theme often runs through those things, which is just much easier to embed and take something forward if you bring people with you. So this is something I always put up as a slide and people pause for a second and think, is that the Al Kingsley that is always talking about EdTech? But the truth of it is that sentence doesn't conclude. EdTech is not the solution, but it is the facilitator, the supporter, the empower, where appropriate and where it's used appropriately. And some would say, you know, it's not the solution. Imply it, that means it's not relevant. And I think, regrettably, they'd be missing the point. It's not the solution, but it absolutely can and it has the capabilities to support those key strands, the teacher, pedagogy, communication, well-being, and parental engagement. And we've all been looking at different ways that work for our cohort and our school to utilize that the most effective way that we can. And I often get asked, what's your kind of vision that you want for the trust and for schools that you talk to about being a school for the digital world? And of course, as you'd expect, I always start by saying it's a pedagogy and experiences and outcomes come first. And, and I often put waiting on that experiences as much as I do on outcomes. Ed talk tech shouldn't be the daily discussion, but it should be an integral part, ultimately, of the school day. I'd expect to see ed tech being used where appropriate, but it's not forced into each and every setting. And again, sometimes that's the missing link. To focus and have an aspiration that teachers have confidence to not only use the tools, but have the confidence to try new tools, take risks, but actually have the, that support and confidence to try them. 
where middle leaders are empowered to innovate with technology, where your IT team, your IT managers and support team are part of the digital discussion, not simply informed of the outcomes, where students are taught and encouraged to be confident digital citizens, which is absolutely key, and appropriate safeguarding is at the heart of the decisions that you take, and particularly when we're trying to look also alongside that with the technology that we have within each of our schools, that we take steps, particularly with scenarios like COVID, to try and mitigate that digital divide. The key one for me, I think, is about, at this time, is about taking risks where appropriate and having the support and confidence to do that, because we're not going to move forward if we're not able to take those chances and actually try new things and new ways of doing stuff. Um, there's a copyright popped up on there. I'm sure Mr. Anderson would be telling me for not, but it's always um, a reference point. It ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. And as always, there's no one prescriptive solution that says this is the most effective way to come up with and then move forward and implement a digital strategy. It has to be shaped around your pace, your staff, and where you start on that journey, whether that starting point is confidence and skills or a technology install base that allows you to actually leverage it. And this is something many would be familiar with. This is kind of our version of it, I've revised slightly. But thinking about the SAMA model, and again, I know you'll, many of you will be familiar with that, but looking where technology in an appropriate sense can be a substitute or it can go one step further and augment, uh, and where appropriate, it can actually modify or actually redefine the way that teaching is delivered, either in the classroom and online. Uh, and as I'm always reminded, it's not a race to, to the end. It's not that one level isn't appropriate. It's finding that blend that's appropriate and considering where different tools might add and enhance an existing experience. One of my top tips, one of my number one rules from personal experience in all sorts of ways, um, less is more, obviously, unless it's chocolate. But less is more is key because there's been a, absolutely a huge pressure put on schools in all sorts of ways. And digital and technology has just been an extra layer on top of all the really important stuff like well-being and safety and safeguarding and so on. But it's really easy to set aspirations high and try and embrace too many things too quickly. And what we've actually seen is it's far wiser and far more successful to pick just a few key foundations and embed them well before you try and race ahead and do too many things. So those were some of the things that were in our mind when we were thinking about how do we create a digital strategy and what are the best ways to implement it. So we sat down collectively, exactly as you'd expect, with that Venn diagram of stakeholders. And as a trust, and across actually a number of the trusts, we came up with some different kind of pillars. And the pillars reflected what areas we were going to focus on. And in that sense of having different stakeholders, and we heard earlier today that sometimes it's more effective to break things down and just have those small groups that are focusing on each particular area being empowered to come up with ideas and bring them back. We came away with our kind of six pillars that we wanted to shape around as part of our digital strategy. And it started with innovating learning. Not surprisingly, we wanted to make sure that was a key focus. And after that, it was about student digital skills, our teacher skills, and then supporting and enhancing creativity, looking at the core technology and infrastructure that we need to support all those other aspirations, building, as I alluded to earlier, about communication being at the heart of everything. And then finally, and absolutely not least, uh, well-being and how all of those things that we can do can be used, we hope, in an appropriate way to also support well-being for staff, students and the broader community. So we started on our Innovate Learning. And the strands that we focused around and have found the most success have been about reviewing the current use of the ICT we have across the trust, that bit about you need to look back before you look forward, selecting appropriate tech relevant to classes and subjects, not being pulled down the line of one device fits all and actually recognizing there are different devices that are more appropriate, not just from a, an obvious age group point of view, but also in many cases, subject based. Looking and doing those kind of very quick SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, and looking at which devices really stand out and are best fit for what we want to achieve. Reviewing the use of supporting apps and alongside that, the send focus, looking at things like Immersive Reader and other tools and how they can be supported, but not just for our CND children, but how they can be seen as part of the standard offering that all children can access for different reasons. 
And of course, when we've been talking about in recent weeks, remote learning, or in many cases, actually, people are talking about remote teaching and remote learning is the next layer upon that, is thinking about how do we do live streaming? How do we find our working day in terms of synchronous versus asynchronous? Do we spend time up front building those exemplars? Can we use the creation of exemplars in a, a, a room of one for recordings to build teacher confidence using the tools? All the different strands that we could build around that. And also having that clarity on that remote teaching and learning, making sure that we look and think about the cohort that we're teaching to. Because clearly, if we're talking about SEND children, we're going to need very short, punchy, synchronous sessions punctuated around other kind of work. And of course, making sure it's age appropriate, different ways of communicating and delivering based on the age group across our trusts. And then we also looked from there at our student digital skills. And perhaps like most schools, I'm sure many of you did, we started by undertaking a student digital skills survey to get that kind of baseline of confidence in their digital skills. And alongside that, thinking on to the point I raised about the digital divide, getting a sense of what technology they already have access to at home, developing those student skills and confidence with the core apps. We often have this conversation about the digital natives, that that term's kind of moved on a little bit. And, and just because a child's confident with modern technology, doesn't automatically mean they'll be able to effectively use the apps that as a school we provide for our communication, our assignments and our, and our ongoing work. So actually not assuming and building that as a core part to actually build the competence on the apps that we want them to have as their foundation. Building CPD on the use of things in our trust, it was Teams, um, but in other trusts, obviously it's Google and Meet and other tools, uh, but building the use of um, CPD on those and building around those so that becomes not just a one-off induction and headline, but a regular revisit of those core skills. One that I'm very passionate about, and I know many of you support, focusing more effort and time on digital citizenship, the tools that we can use to keep our children safe online on their devices, whether it's the filtering, the monitoring, but also from a digital citizenship point of view, actually empowering our young people to actually identify where the risks might be, how they might conduct themselves with their devices when they're not in the supervision of a classroom or the school, and letting them actually have, hopefully, over time, the skills to interpret information and challenge its authenticity as we go along. And of course, at the heart of all of that is ensuring that accessibility for all. We're going at a whistle-stop pace through some of these because I'm conscious of how long you've all been listening in today. Uh, teacher skills and creativity, Obviously, we again, not surprisingly, focus on that staff digital open state of the nation. And that's one where it's not a competition for everyone to try and convince each other that they're technical gurus, but actually identifying where people don't have confidence and where we have an obligation to provide them with that CPD and support. Developing the CPD absolutely around that regular feedback uh, and building the CPD on that, starting with the inset days at the start of this term, we had two days where it was focused very heavily on inset around the use of our core tools to rebuild on what they've been using previously. Um, and then also making sure that's part of the ongoing process and structure within the life of the school. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we consolidated on key trust wide platforms that would become our foundation. That's partly because people have looked for different tools that they have confidence in and lots of many staff who are new to the school might have more familiarity from their previous roles. But we wanted to make sure that if we had some consolidation, it will not only save us cost because there's economies of scale, but it would be easier to support, it'd be easier to train, and it'd be a more consistent experience for students. Looking at things like establishing a monthly online tech club to foster sharing and promoting that flag bearer mindset. So within school, teachers meeting in an informal sense, with a few bits of food and coffee thrown in for free to encourage a bit more of that dialogue. And again, finding time at the moment Absolutely, it's a killer, I know. Developing online resources, using things like Stream, YouTube, whatever it may be, to build some of those exemplars, not just about teaching exemplars, but exemplars on how to use the tools most effectively in simple, accessible, bite-sized chunks. Reviewing of our classroom AV, reviewing our strategy for classroom tech altogether. You know, I put my hand up. We made a decision some years ago that for a cost-saving benefit, Rather than staff having a one-to-one -one laptop process, we put PCs front of class. That meant if a member of staff was off, when we had cover coming into the classroom, 
We always knew there was a device front of class to power that, the interactive screen or whiteboard. What, of course, COVID showed us was when staff were then working from home, we suddenly had a dependency on their own personal technology. We had inconsistency. We had to think about GDPR. And actually, that situation has flipped in terms of us wanting to have the right tools to allow the remote learning and teaching to be delivered from anywhere, from a teacher perspective, not just from a staff perspective. And then we've got our infrastructure. You know, it's the big one that often gets overlooked. Spend our money on the new devices and forget about things like the Wi-Fi and the inf infrastructure. So again, part of that standardizing on trust-wide ICT platforms gave us some benefits in terms of capacity because it allowed us to get that ease of management and economies of scale. And it freed up a bit of the central team's time from looking after a broader set of solutions. We made sure we reviewed our online capacity and services. Um, we looked at things like our data protection policies and added clarity on, as we have in the UK, our data protection impact assessments. And that was really a catalyst because of the, the rush for new tools in March and April, where staff were looking at different online resources. And naturally, perhaps as not as much time as could have been was given to where that data was being stored and how it was being stored. We've also looked at things like the, um, the flexibility of primary assessment tools from home observations. Whilst at secondary, we can send assignments and we can test and assess. Certainly for early years, key stage one, that primary observations are the key to assessments and recognizing where, where the skills are being acquired. So we wanted to also make sure that we could utilize tools that would allow us to capture those observations as parents at home, send them back to staff so they could track and align against that. And that's something we shaped, flipping and wearing my net sport hat in another product that we developed over the last 18 months, which is really school. We also made sure that as a school, we reviewed our disaster recovery plan. And of course, we wanted to feed into this ecosystem a constant check and balance with our ongoing digital strategy group. Because what we don't want to do, what we didn't want to do, was come up with a plan, start moving forward, and not come back and keep re revisiting what was working well, what wasn't working well, or just as likely, given the pace of change right now and the scenarios schools are faced with, whether there were other challenges that needed to be refactored in to our process. And then we also looked at communication, and I've, I've touched on communication. In every organization, it's never as good as it could be, but we needed to make sure we could strive for more. And so we wanted to make sure as a start that we further embedded the use of teams across the trust. It was actually lovely to hear that many staff said that by having a back channel just for staff to communicate on life and general topics, in some cases, they had a greater level of communication than they had had before when they were physically in school and often were in the door and never had chance to actually engage with their peers, but were off straight into the classroom. So we created those extra channels. Uh, we promoted parental engagement and confidence with the use of tools to support our students. So again, making sure for our younger learners, but frankly, for all of our families, making sure that they were confident with the tools. Uh, trying to develop our school to home comms link. Um, and that was an evolution of things like uh, social media. Um, and it was an interesting journey. Many of our senior leaders saw social media as more uh, risk than opportunity. And nobody likes to see a negative comment posted on a local news group. But actually what we found was it was a fantastic opportunity to broaden our engagement, both with families and with the broader community. And we used it to communicate everything from our early years to daily stories, to online sports days and other activities that we could use to promote and embrace. And again, we've also found that by using tools aligned with social media or mobile phones, that we've actually been able to start building better engagement with our hard to reach families the families that wouldn't typically come into parents' evenings and beyond. And again, as part of our longer-term strategy, that process of building better comms absolutely has to be a strength of what we've learned. And then I put it towards the end of our pillars, but well-being, it's at the heart of every conversation. It's certainly at our trust meetings, a conversation we have. Often the biggest concern, actually, is school leaders are very good about talking about well-being for their teams and their staff but aren't so good about actually applying that practice on themselves as well. So that falls incumbent on people like me and others to make sure that we're checking from the very top down that well-being is at the heart of the conversations we have for everybody. And part of that was about fostering staff comms, looking at tools in the same way as we look at ed tech 
to enhance teaching and learning, looking at tools that can provide savings in terms of teacher workload, whether that's simple assessment tracking, better use of rubrics, auto grading, all sorts of different things that hopefully could help save time. Reflecting on remote working versus impact on well-being. Obviously, the last thing we want to do is have staff working even more hours, preparing for online lessons because the confidence levels aren't there. Making sure we don't do emails after a certain time each evening. Better support for SEND well-being with more face-to-face -to -face support and interaction. Having more regular online conversations with our, um, our children that need that structure and support to their day. Uh, making it restructure in the way that we actually make access to our online resources. So pulling things together so that they're easy to access and easy to share. And of course, increasingly schools, certainly in the UK and in many areas, working groups, it's clusters, whether it's multi-academy trusts or other arrangements. And what we wanted to do was share, share best practice, share ideas in an easy way where our peers could access those resources and save time not having to reinvent the wheel. And in the broader sense, which is more to our hope and you know, focus on young people being around within the school building, is also improving things like digital signage and messaging, where we can actually promote success and support in equal measure around the school. And also developing what the, something that already existed, but developing our wellbeing group to make sure that there's a constant check and balance on can we do more. And last night I had a conversation for a couple of hours as part of our trust board, and we were talking about all sorts of things from tickets that staff could be given for going the extra mile and covering lunchtime cover duties to sending out sweets or thank you notes. And most importantly of all, just not taking people for granted. We know teachers and staff are going the extra mile at the moment, and we wanted to make sure that it was visible and that there was also some tangible things we could do to try and help them along the way. I alluded to it earlier on, but developing champions for different strands, having those breadth of experienced people within the trust or school, or in my case, people online that you might recognize from earlier today that you can use to spread the load and have different people you can go to for support. Again, making sure that it becomes embedded within your organization, not the dependency of one or two people. So I guess some of the things that we picked up along the way and I wanted to share was just a few of our sort of top tips. Get everybody involved at the beginning. Don't try and use and do too much too quickly. That's absolutely key. Um, plan for lots of CPD and Everybody nods their heads and agrees at leadership, but actually when we really measure what we mean by lots of CPD, I think the, the reality is some way more than the actual practical. Um, building confidence, absolutely. Let's start with the key bits, get those core foundations, get all staff confident before we set unrealistic expectations and pressures on staff to go beyond that point. Um, identify ways to measure impacts. And I kind of touched on it, Obviously, there's a driver, which is well, we've introduced new technology. So what's the impact? How's it impacted on outcomes? And of course, that is absolutely a relevant question and an appropriate question. But I'd also argue there's another strand, which is about experiences and different learning approaches and creativity in the classroom. And not every single strand will result in a tangible measure on outcomes. Some will be on well-being, time saving and other measures as well. Um, and surprise, surprise. Communication is the key. It's at the heart of everything you do. If you tell people what you're doing, if you ask them to come along for the ride, if you tell them why it's going to be beneficial, and then most importantly of all, if you ask for their opinion, you're much more likely with a co-produced strategy to have success. And that's certainly part of where we are on our journey. And not surprisingly, while I have you all captive, I wanted to talk very briefly and just mention um, as we're sponsors today um, of Classroom.Clown. Um, Zaina touched on it earlier about how classroom management is very different when it's remote learning versus local learning. As a business, and from my professional experience working in education, we've evolved our products over the last 30 years and, and classroom tools in the local physical sense are at the heart of what we've done. What we've learned, of course, is that with COVID, post-COVID, and hopefully for better ideas for staff work-life balance, actually there's a place for tools in the cloud that provide that same level of control, nurture, and ability to quickly capture um, an understanding and measure success when students are working remotely. Classroom Cloud, as you'd expect, 
browser-based, supports lots of different platforms, allows a teacher to start a lesson in minutes, seconds, in most cases, see all of the screens of their student devices when they're at home working on their different um, projects and topics, allows them to engage with them, quiz them, question them, shepherd them, protect them from certain websites, so lock them down to only certain websites for the lesson, remotely launch the websites to, to avoid that, Conversation remotely, are we all on the right page now? Do exactly the same with applications. Chat with our students so that they can provide feedback, allow them to request help directly from the teacher. And we know one of the key strands is about nurturing communication for young people when they're working or when peer group working and back to the teacher. Make it really, really simple to use and of course make it low cost. And I'm the first because I'm the one that's been having schools for many, many months now. Don't rush out and try too many things. Don't try and implement too many tools. Build that strong foundation. But if you're looking at a solution for how you can easily engage as part of your remote learning strategy, as Mark and Ollie mentioned earlier, we're offering some the solution free for the next three months so that you can find the time, have a look at it, have a play, whether it's at home or in the classroom, build your confidence. And if it's right for you, then obviously give us a call. And on that happy note, um, oh, I do need to remind you all, otherwise I will certainly um, be told off. We are organizing next week um, some online presentations. I'm just going to nudge that up there. Classroom.cloud forward slash webinars. If anybody wants to click on the link and subscribe to that, you can come and listen in to some live demos of the product um, throughout next week. And there, without further ado, well done for everybody for making it to the end of the week. Um, I'd just like to say... That's all, folks, from me. Um, and a huge thank you and well done to you, Ollie and Mark, for an amazing day. I can't believe how much CPD ideas, inspiration there is within that. I'm just looking at the screen. Seven hours and three minutes of recording that you've got there. I know many, many people are going to come back to it um, in the weeks ahead to dip into that and pick up some tips. But a huge congratulations to you.